become a very good friend of Bible doctrines to live by, of me. We have a lot of uh, fun together. Uh, I'll never forget, we're sitting in the airport in Thailand just discussing the Word of God. Yeah. And uh, trying to straighten him out. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> oh, here he comes. <laughs> I got the money. Yeah. You get your money. <laughs> you get a half hour. That was Taiwan. Well, that was Taiwan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just proves you could be wrong in two places. <laughs> but uh, no, we have been friends, and uh, and I've really uh, come to love and know the man, and, and uh, enjoy our time together. And uh, about uh, a month ago, uh, the, my phone rang, and it, it was it was Brother Paul, and he said, uh, "Brother." <laughs> Not bad. Is this the Archbishop of the Grace Movement? <laughs> and I said, yes, it is. <laughs> but brother, why don't you come and we'll have prayer, and then you lay, you give us what the Lord has laid on your heart. All right. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the life that is ours in Christ, and we thank you for the privilege we have to share your word uh, from the pulpit or on the street. And we pray now for our brother Paul. We thank you, Father, for him. We thank you for his friendship. And uh, we just pray now that he, as he opens the, the bread of life, as he shares the word with us, that you might just minister through him to us. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. His mama taught him well to clean up after himself. <laughs> so good to be among you this evening, brethren. Before we open the scriptures, I'd just like to share very, very briefly about the ministry of the Korean Bible Society. While we're here at the Evangelism Conference, the other side of that coin is edification. And that's what all the literature here is on all of the tables, and we hope you'll avail yourself uh, to it before you leave. Next year, the Korean Bible Society is going to be celebrating its 75th anniversary. And we're going to be celebrating throughout the year. We're going to have a very special conference in Milwaukee, and you're all invited to come, and we'll be sharing more with you about that in coming days and weeks. The Berean Searchlight. If you aren't on the mailing list of the Berean Searchlight, uh, we'd like to encourage you to sign up. Uh, we'll send it to you free of charge. There's no obligation whatsoever. And we're able to do this because of the faithfulness of dear saints that are sitting in this very room. And so this will help you keep your finger on the pulse of the grace movement. Also, we have the books there from BBS, and my wife has marked everything down half price for you, plus you'll save the shipping cost. Now, we didn't bring all these books, brethren, to take back to Milwaukee with us. <laughs> you'll have to help us. I don't want my poor wife pushing a cart through the airport with four boxes of books on it. And the only way she won't be doing that is if you go over there and stock up on a few extra titles. And we trust you'll avail yourself to that. <clears throat> now, Brother Joel has a number of good works on his table, one of which is a commentary on the book of Revelation. Now, having said that, I want to add a word. But, but, Pastor Stam taught me long ago. He said, when you hear someone say, but, you need to pay very close attention because now you're really getting down to the heart of the matter. Now, Joel has a commentary on Revelation, but if you want the rest of the story, you're going to want to order volumes one and two of my commentary on the subject. It's much, much more extensive, and we trust you'll enjoy it. And I'm working on volume three as we speak. Truly worth half price. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole. You guys are having a way 
way too yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> he always has to have the last word. <laughs> All right, brethren, we'd like you to take your Bibles at this time and turn to the book of Acts chapter 24 and verse 24. Acts chapter 24 and verse 24. For my part here in the conference this weekend, I'm going to be speaking on the judgment to come. <coughs> Brethren, God has appointed a day in which He is going to judge the world in righteousness. Now, we don't hear much about that today, but that was not always the case. I am reminded of Jonathan Edwards, who preached, of course, that famous ser sermon, Sinners in the Hands of of an angry God. And it is said that when he preached that in Enfield, Connecticut, that people actually grabbed on to the pews and held on to one another because they sensed that they were slipping into hell. They were on their knees and begging God of how they might be saved. But many fail to realize there's more to that story. The day before, a large number from his assembly were on their knees for hours, begging God for lost souls, that sinners might be saved when they heard that very powerful message that their pastor was going to deliver the very next day. They begged God for a revival. And God was well pleased to answer them. And indeed, there was a revival and the great awakening that arose at that time with George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. And we pray for the same today. We must understand, brethren, that when we preach the good news of the gospel, when we share Christ and Him crucified. If the sinner spurns the love of God and he rejects Christ as his personal Savior, we do a great disservice if we don't warn them about the judgment to come. That's right. We must preach the gospel against the backdrop of judgment and the wrath of God. Here in Acts chapter 24 and verse 24, Luke records for us, And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and the judgment to come, Felix trembled. We know a great deal about this governor called Felix. He was a very corrupt man, a very evil man. He was bankrupt morally, a very immoral man. And he had a curiosity, though, about those of that way at that time, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and those who proclaim it. And, of course, Paul was spearheading that movement at this time. And so he has Paul come into his court, and he wanted to hear more about this faith in Christ. Really, what he was desirous to do was to listen to Paul, and as we know, he was given to extortion. He was hoping to receive money from the apostle that he might be able to release him. But what he didn't bargain for is when Paul preached Christ in Him crucified, He did so in the power of the Spirit. He was so effective that He reasoned with Felix of righteousness because Felix was a very unrighteous man. Paul proclaimed the terms of salvation 
that God loves the world. Christ died for the sins of the world and was buried and rose again. Paul proclaimed the righteousness of Christ. He showed Felix how his righteousness was as filthy rags and temperance. Felix had no self-control. He had no temperance. And of the judgment to come. And when Paul came to that point in his message, he could see just in the mannerism and the movements of Felix and Drusilla that they were rejecting Christ, that they were rejecting what he was saying. And so he thunders forth with the judgment to come, warning Felix of the coming day of the Lord, of the coming wrath of God at the great white throne judgment. And he described that so vividly that Felix sensed he was standing before the righteous judge of all the earth. And Paul went on to warn him about the hellfire judgment to come. And Felix began to sense that he was slipping into that hellfire. And he trembled. That message so gripped him. And we must do the same. It's incumbent upon us that we warn men of what lies ahead. But before we go there, we want to first consider the good news. You'll always begin with the good news. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. I thought Brother Jim did a very good job on this portion in expounding it. And we're going to go through it very briefly again and share a number of things with you. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, Paul says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now I ask you, with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ, everyone who has ever come forth from the womb, are they not all dead in trespasses and sins? Yes. They are separated from the life and existence of God Almighty. Yes. They are headed for that judgment to come. And unless God intervenes, that's where they're going to end up. And thank God for His grace that He has intervened in the affairs of men. Now, if all men are dead, and they are, then Christ died for all. We believe and teach unlimited redemption. That God has made a provision in Christ through His shed blood. As you study the Old Testament in the four Gospels, the scope of redemption was limited to the nation Israel and those who would be saved through her. She was the apple of God's eye back at that time. But when she rebelled against her Messiah and God set her aside in unbelief, he raised up the Apostle Paul and commissioned him to go forth to the Gentiles. And in so doing, we see the scope of redemption today has been sent forth to all nations. Amen. God's done a very wonderful thing today. Israel, back in time past, had that position of preeminence. Her light was eventually to shine down to us, the Gentiles, at some point in time, once she received her Messiah. When she rebelled against God, God set her aside in unbelief, and he has placed her today on the same plane as all the other nations. And you know what he's doing today? Something very wonderful. He's saving individuals out of all of those nations who respond to the gospel. Amen. Right. And in verse 15, And he that died for all, that they should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 
the very least we can do is live for the Lord when we consider all that He accomplished for us at Calvary. The very least we can do is go out and share the gospel with the lost, that they too might be saved. Remember that individual that came up to you and opened the scriptures and led you to a saving knowledge of Christ. I'm eternally grateful for that. Amen. And you can be a blessing to someone else by doing the same. We're not to be living selfishly unto ourselves, but we're to be living for the Lord. Amen. He's our life. Our life is hid in Christ in God. Then in verse 16, Wherefore, henceforth, though we know man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, now henceforth, or from now on, we know him no more. How very, very true that is. We no longer know the Lord Jesus Christ after the flesh. We don't know him as the lowly Jesus who went about Palestine doing good and healing the sick, making the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear. We don't know him in his humiliation. We know him in a completely different sense today. This portion right here is a portion of change. The dispensation has changed from the law to the grace of God. And so every verse as we go down through here is speaking about change. God's doing something new and different among the Gentiles today. That's you and me. That's why we need to pay such close attention to these passages. As it goes on to say, henceforth, we know him no more. How do we know him then? Oh, we know him as the Savior of the world. We know him as the God of all grace who is lavishing upon us the riches of his grace. We know him as the Lord of glory. We know him as the head of the church, the body of Christ. We know him in a completely more intimate way than they did in time past. Then in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I was listening very carefully when Jim came to this passage. I was interested how he was going to approach it. And he approached it correctly. Because most, even in the grace movement, say, well, this is talking about our Christian experience. That we are a new creation in Christ. And indeed we are. But Paul isn't taking up that matter here. He is taking up that matter in Romans chapter 6. If you want to know how to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you begin in Romans chapter 6. It's explained in detail for you. Here we have a great dispensational passage. Right. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile is the sense, he is a new creation. And I believe that new creation to be the church, the body of Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away. What old things? The law. Circumcision. Water baptism. The dietary laws of the Old Testament. They're gone. Those are old things. They're past. And all things have become new. In what sense is Paul speaking of here? God through the Apostle Paul has introduced a new program called the mystery. Now we know what God was doing in Christ when he raised up the Apostle Paul and commissioned him to go forth to the Gentiles. We have a new hope and a new calling today. It's a heavenly hope. 
and a heavenly calling. We learn that as members of the body of Christ, we are members one of another. These are all new things that you find in Paul's special revelation that was committed unto him. Then in verses 18 and 19, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Brethren, we are not under the Great Commission today. Amen. Those who try to fulfill that commission will quickly find themselves out of the will of God. Because God has set that commission aside temporarily. When he raised up Paul, he gave him the commission of reconciliation. And that's been passed on to us this very day. As it says in verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. You don't see that in the Great Commission. The terms of salvation have changed. Under the law, Israel had to repent. Repent of what? Of her broken covenant relationship with God. You remember that 400 years called the intertestament period between Malachi and Matthew? The heavens were silent. And when God was silent in the Old Testament, it meant he was displeased with his people. Right. And when he raised up John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of our Lord, what did John the Baptist preach? The baptism of repentance. Right. He called Israel to repent. She had to get right with God in that covenant relationship. She needed to again begin to keep the Sabbaths and all the other matters of the law. Once she did that, then they had to believe simply on the name of Jesus Christ. That Christ was the Messiah of Israel, the very Son of God. They simply had to believe in His name, that He was who He claimed to be. And then they had to be water baptized for the remission of their sins. It was an expression of their faith. That's why the Lord says in the Great Commission, He that believeth and is baptized, what? Shall, Shall be saved. Yep. In that order, and that's from the lips of our Lord Himself. If you preach those terms of salvation today, the sinner is going to be lost when you part company. That's right. The gospel today, there's new terms of salvation given to us today. And that is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And I couldn't agree more. Those are the three components of that precious truth. He was raised for our justification, as the Apostle says. Now here in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ said, Be ye reconciled to God. Reconciliation presupposes alienation. And God did a wonderful thing in Christ at Calvary. He reconciled the world unto himself. Now we can go into a great theological discussion here, but to boil that down to simplicity, essentially what God did is he removed all of the barriers. He removed the barrier of circumcision and of the sacrificial system and of the Sabbaths and of the law and the ordinances. <clears throat> he moved them all away. And you know what he's doing today? He's saying to everyone, everywhere, come, right. come. Believe on my beloved son that he died 
for your sins and you can be saved. So essentially here we must be care very careful not to confuse personal salvation with reconciliation. They're not one and the same. But reconciliation is a key component. It has been correctly said there are three parts to the plan of salvation that God has implemented. First you have redemption. That looks toward sin. Then you have recon reconciliation. That looks toward man. Then you have propitiation. That looks toward God. And all three are taught in these sections from verse 14 through 21 and even more fully in other parts of Paul's epistles. And so as we go forth and we preach the gospel, we beg the sinner, as Paul did, to be ye reconciled to God. God's done the work. The work's done. He did it in Christ on the cross. All the sinner has to realize is that a provision has been made for him. That's what really we need first and foremost to realize. A provision has been made for all, but only those who place their faith in Christ and Christ alone in his finished work at Calvary, only those are going to be saved. Otherwise, you have universal reconciliation, then all are going to be saved in the end. Right. And that's the doctrine of the devil. Right. Right. Now notice here, the apostle says that God is not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's grace. Mm -hmm. In time past, I stand before God to tell you, He did impute their sins to them time and time and time again. I'm reminded of Korah and Dathan. You'll remember back during the wilderness wanderings. And essentially Korah stepped up before Moses and he said, Moses, you take too much upon yourself. Who do you think you are? We have many who are holy in the congregation. And of course, he was speaking about himself primarily. And we have 250 princes over here. And they are just as capable as you and Aaron. Famous men of renown. They can carry on the work of the ministry. You set yourself up as a ruler and a judge over us. Who do you think you are? And the heart of Moses was broken because he knew what was coming next. The judgment of God upon their sin. Now those 250 princes and Korah and David, I'm sure they were. They were far more eloquent than Moses. He had a speech impediment after all. They were far more capable, I believe, than Moses. One problem here God didn't call them. He called Moses. Moses was his deliverer. Moses was the one he spoke face to face with. Moses was the one he delivered the law to. And so the Lord appeared to Moses and said, separate them away from the congregation. Put them over there yonder. And Moses speaks to the whole congregation. Those who want to align with Korah and Dathan, you, you go over there with them. Those who are on the Lord's side, those who believe I have been chosen of God, you stand with me. And essentially, the challenge was this. If God does a special thing today, then you will know I am the deliverer. But if these men die a normal death, die of old age like the manner of men is, then you'll know I was never the deliverer of Israel. When Moses finished that saying, do you know what happened? The earth opened up. And Korah and Dathan and those who had 
of course, gathered on that side. They went swiftly right down into the pit, alive. And the earth was closed up upon them. They perished in their sins. And the 250 princes who were offering incense, you know what happened to them? Fire came from the Lord and consumed all 250 princes. You know what was God was saying back then? Case closed. Moses is the deliverer of Israel. God imputed their sins to them in time past. And that's just one of hundreds and hundreds of examples. But today, he is not imputing the sins of the unsaved to them. Today, he is not, mark these words and mark them well, accusing men of their sins. Today, God is not judging sin like he did in time past. But the day will come if they don't trust Christ as their personal Savior, the wrath of God is going to rain down upon them. Let's go back to Romans chapter 2 just for a moment. Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, Romans was written very shortly after 2 Corinthians, so they're about the same time period. In verse 1, Paul says, Thou art inexcusable, inexcusable, O man, who art thou that judgest, and the sense is another. But then if you drop down to verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and his forbearance, and his long suffering. And that's exactly what God is doing in this dispensation in regard to the unsaved. He's being long suffering with them. He's not raining down fire and brimstone upon them. He's being forbearing with them. But notice it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and the impenitent heart, tra now notice carefully, treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That, brethren, is the great white throne when God will execute his justice upon those who reject Christ as their personal savior. And so essentially, what the unbeliever is doing as he's walking through life, as he's sinning against God, sinning against his neighbor, sinning against mankind in general, his entire life is being watched, is being recorded. Every word, thought, and deed. I often have people ask me, Pastor, why doesn't God do something about evil in the world? Why doesn't he judge ISIS, Al-Qaeda? Why doesn't he rain down fire and brimstone on them that they all perish? Because God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Right. Not willing that any should perish, but all will come to know Christ and Him crucified. He's being long suffering today. That's right. That's grace. That's right. That's grace. Amen. Amen. That brings us over to Revelation chapter 20. <coughs> Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. Here the Apostle John, who was originally one of the original 12 apostles of the kingdom. He was one of the last ones left upon the earth. 
and God moved him over to the Isle of Patmos that he might receive this wonderful revelation of Jesus Christ. John didn't receive the revelation of the mystery, apocalypse. He received the revelation of Jesus Christ in the wrath of God to come. And so Paul received the revelation. John received the revelation. Same Greek word, apocalypse. It has the un idea of the unveiling. Paul has unveiled for us the riches of God's grace. John, on the other hand, reveals Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, as the judge of all the earth. Two completely different revelations. And here in verse 11, John writes, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. Here John saw all the unbelievers gathered before the Lord. And he's sitting in the balcony, as it were, and he's observing this vision. And he records for us what transpired. What is going to transpire in that day of vengeance of our God? And notice, he says, I saw a great white throne. It is great, brethren, because of the vastness of its jurisdiction. It begins from the time of Adam, and it runs through all the ages, all the dispensations, all the way out to the end of time as we know it. And it concerns all unbelievers during that period of time. This judgment is not to determine whether those who appear here are saved or not saved. Whoever appears here, they're lost. They're condemned. The judgment's coming. And it will be swift and sure. Notice it's called a white throne because it is pure. It speaks of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going to judge this world in righteousness by His Son. And I saw Him that sat on it. And we know who's sitting on that throne from John chapter 5 and verse 29. We know it's the person of Jesus Christ. In Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All authority has been given to Him from the Father to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. And notice from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and all there was found no place for them. It's as if they melded away in this scene in John's eyes. It says, if they just vanished. And the reason for that is because all attention was now drawn to the Holy One of Heaven, whose eyes are pure, whose eyes cannot look upon sin. All eyes were upon Him. John's eyes was upon Him. And at this time, we know the heavens and the earth will be purged with fire when this judgment takes place. Then in verse 12, John says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The dead here speaks of those who are spiritually dead, those who are outside of Christ, those who who slipped away to a Christless eternity. That's who's standing before this throne. It's a very, very solemn scene. It's a scene that should touch our hearts as we go forth to evangelize. I'll tell you why. 
the unsaved sinner doesn't understand the dangers he's in. But you do understand the danger he's in. You understand the Word of God. That's why you have to warn him. It's one of the tools in your arsenal of evangelism. Or it should be. After you present the good news. After they're non-responsive. After they snicker and laugh at you. Warn them. Because this is what's coming to them. I'd like to read to you something Pastor Stam said about the great white throne judgment and also Pastor Charles Baker in his systematic theology. First of all, Pastor Stam, here at last sinners will find themselves exposed to the searching gaze of him who is of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look upon iniquity. Here finally, their sins will be manifest in their true light as utterly accursed and worthy only of the most dreadful retribution. That's what John is seeing here. Pastor Charles Baker goes on to say, any attempt to minimize God's judgment of sin only serves to minimize the importance and the degree of the sufferings of Christ to satisfy God's holiness. That's profound. That is profound. And the books were opened. Now I believe there are a number of sets of books here. First of all, I believe the term plural books there includes the entire Word of God. God in the person of Christ is going to judge the sinner on the basis of his word. Yep. Have not they heard the word of God? I ask you. Have they not sit in a church and heard about Christ? Have not they heard about the good news, how God loves them and Christ died for them? Have they not been quoted scriptures and warned of this impending judgment? Have not they read that in tracts that were handed out, which proclaimed the word of God? Have not they heard that at funeral services? Have not they had loved ones and friends that begged them to come to the cross before it's too late? I ask you. The unsaved have heard these things and God's going to open His Word. Chapter and verse. It's true. It's all true what was proclaimed to you. And it'll be a witness, a very powerful witness against them. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Now, I have a little different viewpoint on the book of life. I address it over there in the commentaries on Revelation. Now, I realize, having come out of the denominations, that they have a positively romantic uh, position on this, that the moment you trust Christ, the angel in heaven is there uh, writing your name in the book of life, and then he seals it with the Holy Spirit. Now, there is an element there. That is true. But I think the book of life, if you go back to study Psalm 69 and other scriptures, I think all names from the beginning of the world are recorded in the book of life. <coughs> when one rejects the good news, no matter what age they lived in, if they die without responding to the gospel, their name is blotted out. Amen. If you believe the gospel, like many of you have in this room, your name indeed is sealed there by the Holy Spirit. So this book is going to stand as a witness against them. Also, where their name once was, the angel is going to go down 
and he's going to come where the name was, and you know what's there? Nothing. It's blank. And their hearts will sink within them. They're beginning to realize what their eternal destiny is going to begin. As it begins, they're going to see that it's hopeless. There are no second chances, brethren, beyond the grave. You either believe here, because over yonder you won't have another opportunity. Amen. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now I ask you, what type of works are being presented here as a witness against them? Are these good works? No. I don't think so. Are they meritorious works? No. Oh, the sinner's going to make a defense, I'm sure. Are these works that would be acceptable to God? No. Absolutely not. These are sinful works. Amen. They're identified with that unbeliever. Let's look at three passages very quickly. Let's look at Galatians 5.19. Ephesians chapter 5. And one more, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 20. All right, that's beginning Galatians 5.19. Here is Paul is contrasting the spirit and the flesh. Notice what he says in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now when we speak about the flesh in Paul's revelation, it's talking about that sin nature, that old nature. There's nothing good in the flesh that God will accept. Thankfully, we're saved by the grace of God. And while we were known by these things prior to our conversion, now that we're in Christ, we're forgiven of all sins, past, present, and future. These works should not be once named among us in Christ. We're dead to sin. If you sin, you do so of your own volition. But notice what these works are. As Paul goes on, he says, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, partiality, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, or, as we know, discord and heresies. Those are the works of the flesh. And all the unsaved has the capacity to do, brother, is to sin against God. They're at enmity against God. They hate God. The scriptures say so. That brings us over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Following this same theme as in Galatians, Paul says, This ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, <clears throat> who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's his heavenly kingdom. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, now notice, cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. But notice what Paul says as he goes on here in verse 11. And have no fellowship, not some fellowship, no fellowship whatsoever with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. What type of works are these? They're works of darkness. They're evil works. They're called wicked works in Paul's epistles. 
That brings us over now to Revelation, <clears throat> chapter 9, and verse 20. Now this will be after the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. Beloved, the book of Revelation is entirely futuristic. Amen. Revelation 9.20 And the rest of men, this is after the trumpet judgments, and the rest of men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented, now notice, not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor talk. These are the works of the hands of the unsaved. It's displeasing to God. Back to Revelation 20 as we close. Again, John says, And I saw the dead stand before the great white throne. He saw, as I paraphrase that, both small and great, and the books were open. Now think with me here for a moment. If the sinner in this life <coughs> rejects the sin bearer, which we know is the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe Christ died for the sins of the world. I believe he's made a provision for all. But that provision is not put onto your account until the moment you trust Christ as your personal Savior. Right. So if they reject the sin bearer, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to bear their own sins forever in the lake of fire. Forever and ever and ever. <clears throat> and I close with this. The words of our Lord in the shadow of the cross. The Pharisees had challenged him. And the Lord said this. I say therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Let's close in prayer. Father, thy word humbles us tonight. Lord, we have a heavy heart even to preach on these things. And yet we know how important they are. Men live their lives as if there's no tomorrow. But we know the truth. First and foremost, we thank you for our salvation in Christ. May we have a greater burden for lost souls that they might come to know you and that they might be saved by thy grace and receive the free gift of eternal life. For we know right well what awaits them if they fail to do so. May we go forth with a heart of love, with the good news, with the burden to reach out to them before it's too late. For it's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Tomorrow we will continue on. Believe it or not, the worst is yet to come. <laughs> All right. What a day. <laughs> What a day. Amen? <coughs> what a day we've had. What a day. What a capstone for the day. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Looking forward to tomorrow. I was, I was moved by Brother Paul's uh, concern for Vicki. And I trust it that uh, you'll take him up on that and buy all of his books. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All the brothers. Yes. Yeah, but please. Susan has a lot more of them to carry out of here. Than does. Yeah. So, <laughs> buy all of her books, too. Yeah. So, you, um, you, you might beg them to buy them because uh, I have something I'm going to talk to you tomorrow about. Oh. It might be beneficial. 
<laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, no, really, um, you can pay half price or you can pay what you want. It's up to you. <laughs> We've had a good day. We're going to have a good night of rest. And tomorrow, breakfast at 8, at 8 o'clock. So don't forget to be down here for that. And we'll get started right away, right after that. And uh, remember, if you want to pack up in the morning and bring it down with you, that might be better. But we won't have a short break between our two sessions. But uh, just keep all of that. What's that? We will only have a short break between the two sessions. So just keep that in mind. There's plenty of room around here. We're not going to get bothered with some luggage. So uh, bring it on down if you'd like to in the morning. Uh, so you are dismissed. Have a good night of rest. We'll see you at 8 o'clock.